Yeah, Father, thank you. As Talita has prayed, that you are the good shepherd, that your son laid down his life for us so we may have life in him. Restore that to us afresh this morning, we pray. Amen. You can take your seats. To the Zoomers at home, a warm welcome to you. To everybody else, a warm welcome to you. It's good to be together. It's also good to have um, our guest family with us in Kivas. Uh, Bongo will be sharing God's word with, with us a little bit later. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for the children to go out to Sunday school. Yeah, Father, thank you for our kids. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, the faithful parents and teachers and helpers and facilitators. As usual, we pray, Father, every week that your word would speak to them, that they too will take hold of the promises of God. Thank you for our children. Amen. We've been talking about stories and sharing stories, and we're going to continue sharing our stories, our testimonies with one another. And so Dave's going to come up and share his testimony after the kids go out. Thanks, Dave. So this is the story of how I became a Christian. Um, and in my estimation, to be a Christian is not a small thing. Um, it means a lot. It's got serious um, implications and repercussions. And it's a huge joy and honor. Um, but as to how one becomes a Christian, I've been struck by how different and how personal our stories are. But there is an element of mystery to it. Um, but I'll lay out my story as best as I understand it. I grew up in a wonderful loving family but it wasn't a christian family although my mom was a christian um, she occasionally took us to to sunday school um, i remember and enjoyed some of the great biblical stories like david versus goliath i never actually connected the fact that david was the actual king but you know it, it was a david versus a goliath which was exciting <laughs> uh, one of the parables really stuck with me um, the wise man built his house upon the rock the rain came down but, but it did not fall the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The rain came down and it fell with a great crash. Philosophically, that little parable <clears throat> has influenced and remained with me ever since. Um, I remember a quirky Afrikaans teacher at school. She used to carry a little like chihuahua around or something. Um, <laughs> but she, she once shared about her faith to the class and she said, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. <clears throat> also stuck with me. But one of the most defining moments of my life came, came two months after I turned 15. Um, so my mom died of cancer. It's a lot for a young person to go through, to watch their mother die. Um, I was very close to her. Um, it was a blow that shaped me psychologically and emotionally long-term. <clears throat> From then on, I resonated with sadness. Um, I resonated with requiems, with sad movies, it was also something of the disintegration of our family. She was the hub. Um, it left a void in each of us. <clears throat> each of us had to wrestle with life a lot more after that. At that time, with regards to God, I would have described myself as an agnostic. <clears throat> I certainly argued against Christianity with my friends. I felt Christians claimed to know things that were unknowable. Um, Although pure ontological naturalism didn't make sense to me either, I did believe in some kind of distant spark, a first cause that set everything going. Um, but practically, I was a naturalist. Um, in terms of my understanding of humanity, in many respects, I was a child of my time. I believed what I felt any educated person should believe, that we're a product of evolution. Random mutation, random mutation and natural selection are together solely responsible for how we came to be otherwise described as time and chance. I really believed this. Over time, the implications really started to affect me psychologically. I remember two things I can think of, significance and morality. 
I remember taking a shower once and it was the second story and there was a window in the shower, it's weird. <laughs> but anyway, I, I remember looking out that window and looking down onto the ground and thinking, we're just ants. We're as insignificant as puny ants. Um, in the face of an indifferent universe, nothing we do has any significance or meaning. It was quite a gut-wrenching moment. Um, I later heard it described as a sort of sick joke that the universe threw us up. I remember at Varsity, a friend um, who had ultimate beliefs similar to mine, criticizing Robert Mugabe. So this was in the early 2000s. I took him to task over this. Uh, I said, what right? What right do you have to criticize someone else from a moral standpoint, saying that what, you, what you're doing is wrong, saying to Mugabe that what he was doing was wrong. But right and wrong don't exist. There's no basis for morality. One could say, you know, Mugabe was behaving antisocially, you know, but you couldn't say that he was, what he was doing was wrong in any absolute sense. Um, this was not an abstract philosophical point for me. It really bothered me. Um, I had a keen sense of right and wrong and that things really mattered. Um, yeah, so those are two, two major psychological implications of, of believing in a naturalistic worldview. Um, but there's a third point. Um, I've always loved novels. Uh, I've been fascinated by the inner lives of others and my own, the depth of feeling within the human condition. Um, and I hated the understanding I had of what we are, what we were, the evolutionary understanding, because it was so dehumanizing. Um, what is love? It helps your genes perpetuate themselves. What is altruism? It's a misfiring of the cooperation instinct, which has helped humanity to survive. Um, Everything comes down to breeding and survival. I found this way of thinking grated me. I found it ugly. I found it made a mockery of me. <clears throat> but I wasn't impressed with Christianity. I thought it was just sentimental. Um, I felt people went along with it because it made them feel better about themselves. Uh, in fact, I remember there's a little path just down the side of the building. I remember walking past this very building when I was at university and, and hearing some game going on, like ultimate like Frisbee or something. And I remember thinking, yeah, people just do it because of the community, um, but they aren't willing to own up to the truth. Um, nevertheless, as a matter of academic integrity, I felt I should read the Bible. Um, so actually my, my grand gave me this, the study Bible. <laughs> and uh, when I was staying in what was then called Smuts Hall, uh, not far from here, I would read it most nights, uh, but with a critical eye and purely academically, um, in the introduction, it says the translators were united in their commitment to the authority and infallibility of the Bible as God's word in written form, which I was quite impressed with because translators are academic heavyweights. Um, and I was also impressed with the authors of the notes who had the integrity to actually point out difficulties. Um, so as I was reading it academically, I found a strange reversal began to happen. At first, I read it in judgment. I read in judgment of the text, but in time it laid me bare. And I felt to be the one judged. <clears throat> Some of the literature in the Bible is astoundingly beautiful and rich. I became convinced, and this is, this is the crux. I became convinced of the reality and the power of God and of my dire standing before him. <clears throat> Psalm 97 says, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord. So this is quite different from my distant spark. <laughs> yeah. Um, before the Lord of all the earth. So the Bible wasn't at all what I expected it to be. It speaks to the human condition like nothing else. <clears throat> Job cries out to the Lord with such feeling in his suffering. And Jeremiah even says to God, I would speak to you about your justice. I could relate to this book. <laughs> um, so I had quite a few friends at Varsity who were Christians, which was surprising. But I asked one, <clears throat> why do you believe? Why do you believe in Christianity? And he said, and this floored me, he said, because it makes sense. Um, in time, I too came to believe that. It answers the basic philosophical question, why is there something rather than nothing? And it makes sense of who we are. Um, I also never understood, I'm, I'd been told uh, Jesus died on the cross for me. But I never understood why that made any difference to me. I mean, plenty of people have died on crosses. Um, but the book, the Bible, set the scene. It's the sweeping story of the Bible with the story of the Messiah 
uh, the sacrificial system, you know, it starts to make a lot more sense. Um, I remember once, also not far from here, sitting <clears throat> overlooking the UC Dam, um, thinking about life, and a bee landed on my on my on my knee, and it proceeded to clean itself. It was a real marvel to just look at this beautifully crafted creature making such precise movements. Any robotics engineer would be impressed. I came to doubt that time and chance alone was responsible for it. I came to realize that a clear decision had to be made to really bow before the Lord. As one book I read at the time put it, I moved from one side of the room to the other. I do remember a lot of joy at that time, um, but still, it wasn't easy. For me, it was like turning an oil tanker around. Altering my instinctive thought patterns, it's a journey. Uh, and I've still got a lot to become on this journey. But I'm grateful to God to be on it. And I'm grateful to my wife and this church community to be on it together. I'm just gonna pray for Dave. Father, thank you for Dave. Thank you for his story. Thank you that, yeah, that your word is living and active, that it penetrated his heart. Um, thank you for the gospel, for that story that made sense today. Um, yeah, thank you that how you've rescued and saved. Thank you for his place in this community. We continue to pray that he would grow um, in his knowledge and love of him. Mark begins, the gospel that is, begins with, um, <clears throat> I can find it. Mark 1 begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 14 verses later, the time is fulfilled. Jesus came into Galilee and he started proclaiming the gospel of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, right? Jesus comes proclaiming this gospel, um, which is a, a word that can be roughly translated good news or big news or a big story or a story. So Jesus came proclaiming the gospel. We often talk about Christianity being good news, right? So what does it mean? What does it mean that it's good news? What does it mean that Jesus came telling the gospel? That's what we're going to be thinking about a little bit today. Um, our guest preacher, Bongo, um, is here. Uh, we're thankful for you, brother. You can come up. Yeah, Father, thank you for Bongo, for his story. Um, yeah, thank you that he's taking up the call for, for gospel work. We pray for yeah, the work out there um, in the city. We pray that you bring fruit to his, to his ministry. Yeah, thank you for his willingness to come and share with us and share what the good news is about. Amen. Amen. Well, um, good morning again. This is how I prepped. I was going to say good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so this guy has pulled the rug from under my feet. So I'm going to do it the way I prepped it. Good morning, everyone here at um, the Message Church. My name is Bongo. And as I've said, um, I'm part of staff at Union Chapel in Cape Town. Jared asked me to preach on what is the good news? And I thought, Romans 8, Romans 8. Could you please turn to Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8, we'll read from verses 1 to 4. What is the good news? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, weakened by the sinful nature, God did 
by sending his one and only son in the likeness of sinful men as an offering for sin. And thus God condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous standard of the law might be fully met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. Now to this point in Romans, Paul has been, Paul has been at pains explaining that there is a righteousness a righteous requirement of God that we all do not meet. There is a righteousness of God that we all fall short of. This is not something that we uh, need much convincing for, that needs much proving. We don't even necessarily have to know each other that well for us to agree. I'm pretty sure we could, we can pretty, pretty confident we can all agree that we're not perfect. None of us here are saints. Or to use a biblical term, we can all agree that we are sinners. But where we are more likely to differ and where the Bible confronts us is in helping us interrogate why on earth then we sinners would ever imagine that we could have a positive relationship with the Holy God. Sands is gonna put up a, a picture on the overhead here whatever it's called. <laughs> um, behind me is a picture of Senzo Meiyu. Senzo was the national goalkeeper of Bafana Bafana. That's our national soccer team, if you didn't know. Senzo was tragically shot and died in 2014. His murder trial is only seeing the light of day this year. But more than that, the other guy in the picture, other person in the picture is advocate Tefo. This advocate at the moment has the whole country on edge because he is opening the possibility that the people who have been behind bars being punished for this guy's murder might be the wrong people. And therefore that the person, the sinner, who did commit the crime, who should be punished, has not faced justice. This morning, I am not commenting on the merits of this case. I am just pointing to how just the idea, just how the possibility of sinners who do not face judgment puts the whole country on edge. This case has been trending on Twitter for days. You can take it down. You see, as I scrolled through Twitter, I quickly realized again that we actually all understand deep within ourselves that sinners ought to be punished. Sinners ought to be condemned. But somehow, when it comes to the ultimate lawgiver and judge, we excuse ourselves. I have even heard people say things like, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. As if, you know, a jury is going to go out and deliberate on this matter. Because, you know, the verdict is unsure. Only God can judge. But if, if we expect justice from the sense of Mayor trial, from human courts, imperfect as we are, how much more should we expect perfect justice from the ultimate judge and the ultimate lawgiver? 
How can we escape? Can, I, can, you, can you stand before God? You see, the good news of the Bible is that God sent his son in the likeness of sinful man to be like you and me so that his son would live the life we were supposed to live. You know, we often talk about Jesus or think about him as having died for us, and that's correct. But as the famous saying goes, before he died for us, he lived for us. And having lived the perfect life that we were supposed to live, he then died the death and received the condemnation that we were supposed to receive. In other words, the condemnation that we, as sinners, the one that we deserved, did not fall on us, but fell on him on our behalf. He got our deserved condemnation. And we got his perfect life. Or Gerard and Sands, the theologians, call this the great exchange. And because of that, we can now approach God confidently on the basis that Jesus lived the life we were supposed to live. And on the cross, absorbed the condemnation that we were supposed to endure. Meaning, God can now deal with us positively without him being a corrupt judge. Without him being an, an unjust God, not an unjust God. He is a fair God who does not swipe, sweep sins under the carpet. You see, we are the ones who pray Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I dare approach you because of him. The condemnation that was supposed to fall on us falls on him. And that's what we mean by we are saved. It's a sin to see you. Our slates are wiped clean. And by his spirit in Romans 8, he enables us to live new lives. And that's what we mean when we say we are born again. I want to ask you this morning, what is your relationship like with God at the moment? What makes you think, oh, sinner? that you can have an audience with the Holy God. To the good news of Christianity, very simply this morning, is that God has made a way for you to have a relationship with him without him blitzing you. He invites you to relationship. How's your relationship with God this morning? Or maybe more basic, can you honestly say you have a relationship with God this morning? Now, I'm not going to this morning say, um, raise your hand if you want to have a relationship with God. But I will say that God invites you. God calls you to have a relationship with him. And this is not something that a preacher or your leaders or anyone can do for you or with you. We can only go so far. We can only preach the good news. And we'll stick around for questions later and so on and so forth. But you do the work of meeting with God in your prayer closet and make sure that you have a relationship with God. And so then the good news is, therefore, 
there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For the law could not do, weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his one and only son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And, and thus God condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully made in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. God sends Jesus in the likeness of sinful men. In other words, God, he becomes a man in order to be what we could not be. He becomes a man in order to do that which you and I could not do. He comes in the likeness of sinful men like you and I in order to run and run in front of us the course that we were supposed to run. And so what is good about the good news is that not only are we now credited with his life and shielded by his death, but through the resurrection, Jesus actually completes this course that we were supposed to run. Through his resurrection, Jesus goes before us where we are yet to go. Cast your, arm, cast your eye down to verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. You see, what happened to him is going to happen to you. He is now, right now, what we are yet to be. He enjoys now what we still hope to enjoy. In Jesus, the future has been brought forward. I say this because through him, we have a sneak peek of the future. We have a sneak peek of what we will be, of what is yet to come. And so when it comes to the future, there is an already. When it comes to the future, there is an already. It is him. It has started. And so listen to this. It is Jesus Christ himself who is the content of our hope in God. It is Jesus Christ himself who is the actual content of our hope in God. So our hope in God is not merely of the one of crossing fingers and hoping things pan out. Our hope in God is one where we look to Jesus, who has run this race before us. We look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who has already completed this course that we are still on. And therefore, being on the other end stands as what we still hope for. And so it is in that sense that Jesus is the content of our hope. We have a sure hope. We have a living hope. And so we live our lives now then. We run this course that we are on now. Fixing our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our salvation. We make sense of our now here. And we make sense of now and the brokenness of this world that we live in looking at how he endured it. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And so what is good about the good news is that it's not just good news for Jesus or even just for the future, but that in the here and now, 
today, we don't have to fumble as we make our way as broken people in a broken world. Rather, we look to Jesus as we live. Now, to be sure, I am not saying there is immunity to the brokenness of the world. We're not immune. We are not immune to it. No. There's no pretending that sin is not sin or that the effects of sin do not still carry on and that we don't still live with those things. No. But we look to the one who was able to endure it and now lives at the right hand of the Father. You see, C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Well, the good news of Christianity is that the Son of God was sent in the likeness of man to live for us, to die for us, and to be the firstborn of God's new creation, such that the rest of us may be able to live in light of what he has already done. And so by him, we see everything else. And as I close this morning, I know that we don't know each other personally, so I don't really know the details of your life. But in, the, but in any congregation, on any given Sunday, as we bask in what Jesus ushers in, the new reality that he is, that he is the beginning of, I'm pretty sure that there are some of us here who are sick in body or mind. And to live in light of our Savior and in light of the good news of the gospel, the man who went through death and came back, we can take hope that he will do for us what he did for himself. That he will restore those aching bodies and redeem them into the glorious resurrection body that he now has. For those of us who are in want, are in need, the man who came back from the other side of the grave will keep for us that which he kept for himself. For our hope is the hope that he had as he denied the luxuries of this world. Push for sure, but keep perspective. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And for those of us who are lonely, alone, bereaved, if that door be death, we watch our loved ones go through it. And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus went through there. And we wait, and behold, on the third day, he came back. And the man who came back from the other side, willingly, and came back. The Bible says, if the spirit of him who raised us from the dead is living in you, and in them, he who raised Christ, from, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to their mortal bodies also, and they will come through those doors again on death. For those of us in distress, in despair, the man who was in such distress that he sweat blood, what he did is that he fixed his gaze, talking to himself, we see him in the garden, and reminding himself of what lay ahead. He preached the good news to himself. Our hope is his hope.
You see, we believe in the good news of Christianity as we believe that the sun has risen. Not only because we see it, but because by it, we see everything else. And so the good news is the announcement and invitation to come and partake in the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the anchor of faith that he is for us. We thank you that through him, we are able to put things in perspective and view everything else accordingly. I pray, Lord, for each and every person here this morning that you would continue to fix this, this faith, this gospel as an anchor for their soul and that you would see us through this broken world with its broken bodies until our faith shall become sight and we shall see you face to face. For your namesake and for our benefit. Amen.